We'd like to take a closer look now from a Canadian perspective. Carlo Dade is the director of the Trade and Investment Centre at the Canada West Foundation and an expert in global trade and public policy. He spoke to us from Calgary. The U.S. Trade Representative said recently that in the NAFTA negotiations, the talks were beginning to converge uh, on the issue of automotive content. Uh, what do you make of that? How significant is it? Well, it's uh, another positive step, but uh, and, a, and a very significant one, because content in autos was one of the major hurdles in the negotiations, along with things like supply management, uh, government procurement, and the other things uh, that, that still haven't been resolved. So it's a good sign. But again, with these negotiations, we're never sure if it's one step forward and two steps backwards, or two steps forward and one step backward. So we really have to keep our eye on, on the broader picture. I would say, though, that the bigger story, though, actually was not the negotiations itself, but the fact that the U.S. Trade Rep representative the office is finally fully staffed. We've been negotiating with the Americans with no one but Lighthizer and one deputy with half a dozen deputy posts unfilled. Just this past week they filled all the posts. So on the structural side I think that the Americans are finally fully staffed and that's really the, the bit of good news that gives me hope more than the individual twist and turns of the negotiations. What do you think that actually means for the negotiations given uh, the unpredictability of their boss essentially? Well, it's more of a damper on the unpredictability. The negotiators have a political line between them and the administration, deputies of lighthizers whom they can get better confidence in the positions. So the machinery, the negotiating machinery on the American side should finally move a bit smoother. What can you tell me about the tone around these negotiations? Because when the whole issue first emerged, there were concerns that Canada was going to throw Mexico under the bus, that there would be this contentious relationship. What can you tell us about the tone that's emerged now around the talks? Well, between Canada and Mexico, it's been quiet cooperation. Neither side really wants to do much in terms of cooperation to provoke the Americans. Uh, despite their size and power, the Americans have the surprising tendency to worry about people ganging up on them. So I'd argue that both Canada and Mexico, the, the political and the negotiating teams, have done an excellent job in coordinating quietly and, you know, that bit about throwing Mexico into the bus. Yes, that idea circulated in Ottawa early on but it very quickly evaporated. Do you think a change in government in Mexico could make a difference? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But I would argue that it's not going to make as large a difference as people are saying now and as I originally thought. The potential for on, on Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, AMLO, uh, to come in as the quote-unquote leftist, quote-unquote populist candidate in Mexico will certainly change the tone of government and change some of the people uh, in the government. The candidate who's leading in the polls by 10 points in Mexico has already announced uh, his economics minister and his NAFTA negotiator. And in that, you know, you find very pragmatic choices. And that's a major difference from the U.S., where Trump has brought in ideologues like Lighthizer and Ross. Uh, the Mexicans, even in the candidate that everyone most fears, his choices for chief NAFTA negotiator and for minister of the economy are pragmatic, uh, well-educated uh, folks, not ideologues. And where does, that, where does that put Canada? Well, that puts Canada in, I think, a slightly more reassured position. Uh, we're relying on Mexico in the negotiations. We're working on them. We need a sane partner in the room, and that's turned out to be Mexico. And so the assurance that, at least with the economic team and the negotiating team, that streak of having competent professionals who are pragmatic, not ideologues, um, will continue. Of course, the, um, AMLO could change his mind once he gets elected, but the signals he's sending are a pragmatism. I know that the view of these negotiations is a bit of a, a sort of a moving target from optimism to something much less. At one point, I think you suggested you thought the odds of a deal were about 50-50. Where do you think that sits now? Oh, 50-50. <laughs> uh, with, Donald, with Donald Trump, it's always 50-50. And this is something we've had to readjust our mindset to in Canada. But with Donald Trump, we really don't know. He could change any day and decide to go ahead and rip up the negotiations. There are reports, perhaps apocryphal, 
that Trump actually has the withdrawal ledgers drawn up sitting in the drawer in his desk. So we can't take off the table um, that he won't do this. We also, the things that would guide us in the past in terms of analysis, political signals, a definition or an examination of U.S. interests, uh, the economic groups, lobbying groups, those things haven't held sway with policy in Washington. So the normal guideposts in the past are, are fairly useless. We're in completely uncharted territory here. And so that's why the 50-50 is an important reminder of just where we are today. Your organization has, has suggested that businesses, and particularly small businesses, need to prepare themselves uh, for the possibility that there is no NAFTA. Um, what, what's at stake here for them particularly? Well, for small businesses, what we found is that it's actually an individual business by business decision. So the smaller businesses, obviously we're talking about firms that can't afford to hire a major consultancy to run the numbers or to lobby for them or aren't part of a supply chain with a large manufacturer that will give them this information. But for that large swath of other companies that are trading with the U.S. Um, that have never needed a trade commissioner because they inherited the business from their parents and they've always had NAFTA, there are potential significant changes or there are potential no changes whatsoever. The bottom line is businesses have to run the tariff numbers. Under NAFTA, practically everything that we trade with the U.S. is tariff-free, obvious exceptions like milk and other things, but pretty much everything else is tariff-free. If NAFTA ends, we revert back to the World Trade Organization most favored nations tariffs. And depending on the business, those tariffs can go from zero under NAFTA to zero under WTO, or they can go from zero under NAFTA to 12, 10, 4% under the WTO. In the guide, we have an example of a company exporting jam to the U.S. Under NAFTA, jam, a jelly jam, is tariff-free. But under the WTO, not only is there a tariff on jam, there's one tariff rate that the Americans can charge for cherry, another for apple, another for raspberry, another for lingonberry, and another for blueberry. So the complexity for businesses can be no change or it can be significant. Thank you very much for your expertise on this. I look forward to speaking with you again as this goes forward. My pleasure.